He's the former president and publisher of the Sun Herald, and now he's on the radio. Welcome to Coast View with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi Gulf Coast 103.1. Welcome to Coast View, the show that celebrates the men and women who are making Coastal Mississippi a better place to live, work, and play. Hey, before we get to our guest today, I just want to congratulate and thank the city leaders in Gulfport for um, taking uh, very de- de- decisive steps to take down our divisive flag. Um, you know, it's, it's so important that we keep moving in that direction. They join a chorus of cities across the state of Mississippi who no longer fly that flag, and I can't think of a university in this state that has flown that flag in the last couple of years. So so move in the right direction. They're taking a step to make Gulfport a better place for all citizens to live, work, and play, whether you visit here or whether you live here. And I really appreciate it. Now it's time for the state of Mississippi leadership to, to continue to move in that direction. We really need, especially in this moment in time in our nation's history, to get that divisive and oppressive symbol behind us. Okay, we're going to move on now. Uh, We've got our friend, Dr. Nicholas Condor, with us today. He's an infectious disease uh, internist at Memorial at Gulfport. He's been on the show several times, and it's just a good time to get an update on on what's happening. How are you doing, Dr. Condor? I'm doing great, uh, Ricky. Thanks for having me back. Thank you very much. It's good to see you. Um, So what's your read on things these days? Well, you know, um, let me start with a disclaimer. You know, we're learning more and more every day. We're learning more and more every week. The data changes. And uh, so it's just a reminder that we're learning. We're continually learning about this virus. And so what we say today, we may learn more that that uh, makes it obsolete uh, in the next few days or the next week. Um, what we're seeing are some some overall trends. Um, you know, places are opening up. We always said we would have more cases when we opened up. Uh, the caution was, uh, you know, again, to keep the vulnerable and the elderly and the people more likely to die from it, from not getting it. Um, and so we're seeing a mixed picture. I think uh, nationally the trends look good. Um, we're testing half a million people a day, which is amazing. And the positive rate the last few days has been about 4 to 5 percent. And now prior to that, we tested, uh, you know, I think something like 24 million people, and the positive rate was 11 uh, percent. Uh, So more testing with a lower percentage positive is good news. Um, And actually, the number of positives per day is going down. And in the last couple of days, we've had the least deaths per day uh, between three and four hundred, whereas before it was, uh, you know, three to five thousand. And so those are all very positive trends nationally. Now we're opening up and we're seeing pockets of increase. Uh, We're seeing increases in cases here. And it's not just because of increased testing. They're seeing increases in, in Texas and Arizona and some big cities in Texas. And so those trends nationally may change again over the next several weeks because hospitalizations and deaths do follow new cases. Um, but overall, pockets of increased uh, cases in areas that probably were really not hit in the first place. So they're maybe experiencing their first wave uh, balanced by nationally and overall uh, improving trend. So how concerned are you about the uptick that we're experiencing, say, in Harrison County? Uh, well, it's always concerning. Um, you know, we, we knew that with during the lockdown, uh, the lockdown slowed the virus down, and, and we, like I said, we really never experienced our first wave. You know, we had less than two percent uh, positive people in our healthcare system, so that shows we really hadn't had it really well established here, which was good. But also, the cases didn't go away, and so the lockdown was never going to make this virus magically disappear. So we always talked about it wasn't really a matter of when, but kind of how we came out of the lockdown and if we did it safely. And, and it's a mixed bag. You know, I see some places doing a good job with their social distancing and, and avoiding cases. But but there's a lot of people who I think have kind of decided that they don't care if they catch this. And, and so I'm not surprised that there's an increase in cases. And to answer your question, you know, I have some concerns um, that uh, that things could get worse. Um, but yeah. uh, But I'm cautiously optimistic. Because uh, we do have better treatments and we do have better plans on what to do with patients, you know, as they uh, as they catch the virus. Yes, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. It's, uh, you know, the very first conversation you and I had, it's, you know, we, we talked about the tools that are at our disposal, the face mask, the hand washing, not touching face, social distancing, protecting the vulnerable, all that stuff. Those are still the tools we have today. But we had a good conversation about uh, the whole issue of herd immunity and, right. you know, how that might work. Uh, we had done such a good job of containing it for the most part, particularly here in coastal Mississippi, that the notion of herd immunity may not necessarily be 
uh, something that we could we could strive toward. Is that still sort of out of the question, really, in the scheme of things, or is it is it is it back into play? Well, you know, I do think that um, you know herd immunity is going to be the key to eliminating the virus as an ongoing threat. And so you either get there with people catching the virus or with the vaccine. Um, and so the idea is to delay. Uh, to minimize the morbidity, the mortality, you know, the bad effects of the virus, you know, on your community and on our country uh, while we're waiting for that vaccine. Um, you know, we talked about different countries with different strategies. Uh, and so some might say, well, all we did with the lockdown was delay uh, people catching the virus and getting towards herd immunity, which is true. Uh, I was a big proponent of the initial lockdown because when we, when we started that lockdown, remember, we didn't have testing readily available. We didn't have an idea of of therapeutics, um, and we were that much further away from a vaccine. And so, at least that initial lockdown, we have the ability to diagnose people, and we uh, we have some tools at our disposal just to take care of them. We didn't have PPE. I mean, we were yeah. recycling PPE, and we were critically low. And so, all those factors are better. So, I do think that now is the time to do our best again, minimize the impact on society. I think the economic impact of the lockdown was tremendous. And so, uh, so I, I do wish people were more careful when they go out with those social distancing things you mentioned. Uh, but eventually, we had to come out of it with some more tools. And I did want to add, you know, you mentioned the the tools at our disposal. The two most important tools are protect the vulnerable and don't go out if you're sick. You know, we, we need to keep that in mind. If you're coughing and, and you're ill, please stay home. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting to see when you go out. You can go in one store and you know, 90% of the people may have a face mask on. And then you come over here to this other store and no one has a face mask on. <laughs> so right. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, you know, when you're indoors, though, you still feel very strongly that wearing a face mask is the right thing to do. Right. Yeah. And I saw something, I saw a headline that said uh, something like wearing a mask may not protect you. But when you got the nitty gritty of that headline, they were simulating someone repeatedly coughing with a face mask on demonstrating that things can leak out around the face mask if you repeat, repeatedly cough in the face mask. Well, my answer to that is, well, if you're repeatedly coughing, you should not be out and about. You should be yeah. isolated in a room in your own home, uh, but still that's gonna decrease the amount of spread. You know, I am a proponent of indoor face mask wearing. Uh, obviously you can't wear it when you eat and when you drink, um, but, um, but definitely um, I think it does decrease the risk of spread. And that's about all we can do if you're gonna conduct business indoors. I saw a picture on Facebook the other day. I won't mention who this is, but it was a, a get together of a bunch of women. And the initial shot, they all had their face masks on, but they were standing shoulder to shoulder touching each other. And then later on, they all had their face mask off and they were just kind of enjoying each other. Um, you know, it, it's a fine line. I mean, it, you know, I don't, I don't know how often this is happening, but I, I mentioned to you a story that, that I read about the, uh, the the young woman who had been quarantined for quite some time. She was a hospital worker, and she she's from from Florida, and she went she dropped her guard for one minute. They went she went with fifteen of her friends to a bar, and she and all fifteen of her friends ended up getting COVID. I mean, and she talks about I dropped my guard for one minute. Um, probably if they're young, they're, you know, the, the outcome's not going to be so bad. But then you have to worry about. Who have they been in contact with and how long were they infected before they realized it? And were there any vulnerable people around them? All these issues are still very much something we should be thinking about, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. You know, um, a bar, again, people close together indoors uh, without uh, presumably I don't know where they were without much ventilation. You know, that, that makes sense. You know, you hear of a poker game where nine people all a poker game get it. Well, you know what? If you're playing poker, you're sitting around each other, you're facing each other, you're breathing towards each other. So those type of exposures make sense. You know, I really wish people would stop and think about adapting their behavior. If you want to go out and have drinks with friends, go to a place that has outdoor seating and sit outdoors and, and face the, you know, face the ocean together. Don't face each other in close contact. Yeah, I see people eating at, at small crowded tables right, right on top of each other, you know, spread out a little bit. You know, those are the sorts of things we can do. But to your larger point, you know, the younger people. And understandably so, they're not as concerned. They're not as concerned. You know, the, the chance of dying from this when you're under 25 years old is extremely low. It's less than the flu. And, and I saw something that said that you're more likely to die of a lightning strike if you're under 24 years old and healthy 
than you are from coronavirus. So I don't blame the young people for not being concerned, but but we're hoping that everyone thinks, like you said, about, about the second and third order effects. What if you catch it and you bring it to your home? Who in your home is vulnerable? What if you bring it to your grandparents? But it, what if you bring it to work and you work in a closed environment and then now everyone at your work has it? And so, so those are the things we need to worry about. So with increased testing, we hope to catch those people, pull them out, and you know, test their exposures, pull them out, and we hope to squash it so it doesn't spread. That, that's that contact tracing you hear about. And we hope that we, we do a better job of that now that we have ready access to testing. And that may be why we're seeing increased positive tests, too, because we are doing a better job of testing contacts and catching asymptomatic people. And, and so that may be a good thing uh, with the numbers going up that we're catching those asymptomatic people and pulling them out. We have uh, Dr. Nicholas Condor. He's an infectious disease doctor internist from Memorial Hospital at Gulfport, and he's a friend of our show. We, we come back and talk on a regular basis about what's the latest, uh, not only in the U.S., but here in coastal Mississippi. And, you know, what what is he focused on and what concerns does he have? And we're having that conversation. We'll continue the conversation after... Uh, this break. So come, come back and join us when we get back from the break. Thanks. Subscribe for free to the Coast View podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Talking to the people that help make the coast such a unique place to live. This is Coast View with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi Gulf Coast 103.1. Welcome back to Coast View. We have Dr. Nicholas Conger. He's an infectious disease doctor, uh, internist at Memorial Hospital at Gulfport. Hey, Dr. Conger, I had a wonderful honored yesterday. I hosted four governors on the show at one time. I had Governor Mavis, Governor Musgrove, Governor Bryant, and Governor Barber all at the same time. And we talked about a um, this fund called the Mississippi 30-Day Fund, which is a, a fund that has no administration, administration costs that's been launched in the state of Mississippi so that small businesses can get some a, a, for, a forgivable loan so they can hopefully survive. But we had a great conversation just about a lot of things. I asked him, for example, how has their life changed in the pandemic? And uh, it was so interesting hearing each of them talk. Just a couple, for example, Doc, uh, Governor Mavis said that in his in his uh, role as the as the Secretary of the Navy, when he left there, he was the most traveled senior executive in U.S. government history. He did 1.3 million miles to 52 countries, and he talked about that. And he said, well, today he's at the House. He's, very, he's left the House very—he leaves the House very rarely. He has not been to his office one time. But he really spoke to how seriously he's taking this and that he's going to He's going to stay hunkered down until there are better answers for someone his age. Governor Barber, I thought, was kind of funny about it. He said that he's been married for 48 years. And he said, Marsha, his wife, said that the secret to their marriage has been that Haley has been gone for 41 of those years. <laughs> I thought that was that was kind of funny. He said that suddenly in March, she gets him cold turkey, the way he described it, you know. <laughs> But uh, but you know they all talked about it to a man. They talked about how it's, they've been you know they've obviously been living life in a very safe way. There there you know a lot of reflection on family and friends and all the things that you and I've talked about in the in the past. But it it was terrific talking to them. But one of the things they didn't talk about was um, you know they didn't you know they were using the information that you constantly talk about the tools that are at our disposal. They're using all of that information to guide their lives and their families' lives. And there's there was no discussion about misinformation. But there is a lot of misinformation out there today. And I think so much so that some people kind of throw their hands up. Now, if they throw their hands up because they've made a conscious decision that they don't care if they they catch it, and they're not near vulnerable people, so that's going to be okay. That's up to them. That's you know they're empowered as Americans to be able to make that decision. But if they make a conscious decision to throw their hands up based on misinformation, that's a whole other set of, of of potential problems. What do you what do you say to that? Um, so uh, yeah, 
let me round back to what you were talking about earlier. You know, if you if you look at history, we've had a uh, like a plague or a uh, or uh, this massive infection with the Earth. You know, almost every 100 150 years. The most recent one being the flu of 1918. Uh, if you if you think about the plague, Black Death, bubonic plague. I mean, that shaped Europe for for centuries. If you look at the art and the history, if you ever have the opportunity to go to Europe, so much. So much of the history was wrapped around how impactful those, those Black Death plagues were. And then 1918, the great influenza outbreak in the U.S. and across the world, you know, that, that shapes things to come. So this infection is going to shape people's behavior in the short term and then the medium term. Uh, so those effects are going to be lasting, that, that, that uh, scared to travel feeling, et cetera. Those effects, you know, are going to be there. You know, as far as the information goes, um, the... the um, I feel like the CDC and the federal government has been fairly consistent. They came out with the social distancing guidelines. They've not really changed them. It's been the different applications at the state level and the city level uh, that I think have caused the confusion as well as as well as uh, uh, the way the media has interpreted different events as well. And so so some of the blame might be on the centralized federal government. Some of the blame might be on the local governments. Some of the blame may be on the media. And, and so I think the mess, I mean, you have to step back and say, well, what do we know about this virus? We know it's highly contagious. We know that it's extremely deadly, but that the, the, the deadliness of the virus is definitely tiered by age. The older you are, by far the more likely you are to die from it. The younger you are, by far the more likely you are to not have any ill effects, maybe even asymptomatic. Uh, we know that if you're obese or have diabetes, regardless of your age, you're at risk. We know that if you are close to other people who have the infection, they may be able to transmit it before they have symptoms. And so if you are talking or listening to someone or really in close proximity indoors, particularly more than outdoors, you're more likely to catch it. Those are kind of the, the truths we know about transmission. And I believe, you know, they should be applied universally. Yeah, <clears throat> so interesting. And the, the other part of media that I would mention is social media, the, the, the sharing of just just absolutely inaccurate information about how to stay safe or you know, certain information that simply says don't worry about that or don't worry about that when in fact you know they should worry about either one of those things you know people posting on social media that small business owners are getting arrested <clears throat> for defying the order to stay closed because they're trying to feed their family and then you know the same municipal you know arenas allowing just massive protest. So, you know, again, so many mixed messages that are out there. Um, you know, what are your thoughts about what we might see from the protests, you know, in terms of positive tests? So, um, you know, that that is a ripe environment for the virus to spread. We did talk about being outside is, is better than being indoors. Um, and, um, and so you had a large group of people in close proximity to each other shouting, and we've talked about how projecting your voice loudly uh, probably does push out more virus particles. And so to me, that was actually a, a test case to see how much it's going to spread in that community. Now, again, I know we don't want to get into politics. I've heard that, that uh, the governor of New York had told them not to ask that question. I think that's a bad idea. We need to ask that question because we need to know. Because we talked last time on your show about, um, about sporting events. Can we do outdoor sporting events? And I, and I told you, I just don't know what that risk is going to be like. To me, the protesters is a great test case. If we see tremendous spread among the protesters, that will suggest that that's maybe not a good idea. If we see minimal to no spread um, or, or much less spread than we thought, well, then, hey, that was a great test case for that scenario. Then we can go forward. I understand there's like a NASCAR race coming up in mid-July in Bristol. Um, that's going to be, as far as I know, the first outdoor sporting event, large scale, 30,000 people. It'd be nice to have the data on how many people caught it during the protests before that event occurs. Yeah, that, <clears throat> it's so interesting. You know, America being a f free like it is and having, you know, giving local governments the ability and state governments the ability to sort of adjust their plans based on the experience in those states. And you know, obviously, you know, different governors have different approaches. Let's, let's take, for example, President Trump's gonna have the um, indoor rally in Tulsa. And of course, the, the officials in Tulsa are just screaming to the president, please hold the rally outside. But as you pointed out offline, the Tulsa numbers are not so bad. So what's your thoughts about the Tulsa situation? Right. You know, again, I'm going to give the same answer I gave you about um, sporting events. Um, we just don't know. 
Um, and so at some point, someone's going to do it. Um, and so um, I'm interested to see what the numbers are going to look like in an indoor rally in a place that has a low incidence. Um, obviously, they're signing waivers. Um, so I, I presume, you know, that, um, you know, former Vice President Biden is going to want to hold rallies, too. Uh, I, you know, there are other countries that are starting up some indoor sporting events. And so this is all new. So it, it could be a massive spreading of coronavirus events. It may not be. But we just don't know the answer. And so it, it's interesting that that's going to be the first large scale indoor event. Um, it, to me, it's a bit of a risk, um, but we'll have to wait and see. So I wonder, again, this is not a political statement by any stretch of the imagination because this show is not about that. But I do wonder if it's sending the wrong message that it happens to be the president of the United States is having the indoor event. And the fact that he's asking people to sign waivers, you know, it just it tells you they're concerned about it. Or they wouldn't be asking them to sign the waivers. So um, it will be very interesting to see where we are, say, four or five weeks down the road. So we can see data that's coming out of, for example, the NASCAR event and then the, the various outdoor protests that have occurred. And then, you know, the president's rally. You know, a lot of data is being developed. I, I mentioned right. to you, too, off the line that I read a story out, out of Atlanta where Atlanta is really wrestling with conventions and meetings. And they've got all these guidelines that they put in place, which suggest that they're trying to figure out a way to do it. But they think the rebound is going to be really slow. Um, so you have these very cautious approaches that are being taken around conventions and meetings, et cetera. And then you're having this not so cautious um, approach with the president and his rally. I think we just need to let some of this play out and see see where we are and and see and, the information yeah. tells us, you know. Right. And that's right. And, you know, because um, we don't have good information. And your your point that we're a free society is, is very well taken. You know, people say, well, what did South Korea do that was so, you know, great to suppress their numbers? Well, not only do they have uh, uh, excellent testing from the get go. They also pulled people out of their families with a positive test, whether or not they had symptoms. So can you imagine America, if you tested positive, they pulled you out and put you in a home and, and, and said, you stay here until we say you're not contagious. Our citizens would never go for that. So we do have this level of freedom. I do think that people are informed. I think they're making their own choices and it may result in it not being so bad or it may result in an explosion. I think we need to wait and see, but do our best to protect the vulnerable, those who are likely to die from the virus. Protect the vulnerable, protect the vulnerable. We're going to say that over and over again. I say it almost on every show. But Dr. Nicholas Conger, thank you for your friendship and your uh, your leadership. We'll come back to you again in a couple of weeks and see where we are. There will be a great. lot of new information by then. So we look forward to talking to you. Take care. Great. Thanks for having me again. You bet. Follow Super Talk Mississippi Gulf Coast 103.1 on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Super Talk MS Coast 103.1.